Alrighty, well, thank you, Kelsey, for a fantastic primer about how little we still know about these, at Pluto, uh, these fantastic Pluto structures. So if you will indulge me on a little side quest now as to maybe another possibility, what kind of processes that we're possibly seeing on Pluto? An intense of mud volcanism. So mud volcanism is actually not true volcanism. It's actually pseudo-volcanism, which means it's in no way tectonic uh, related whatsoever, but in the sense of it's overpressurized liquid and gas buildup. Uh, so in our journey here, I will explain what exactly is mud volcanism compared to magmatic. Uh, why we see some of these uh, kind of clues leaning toward that with some of these uh, uh, Pluto candidates. Possible formations that may be like, oh, well, maybe this is how it was formed. Uh, just some hypotheses, and then I will release you with the summary. Uh, so when you think of mud, you think of organic, you think soil, you think icky, gross stuff you get on the bottom of your shoes on a rainy day. I, that's obviously not possible all the way out on Pluto. But in the sense of volcanism here, mud is essentially just slurry. That's just another term for it. it's just slurry. It's just a whole bunch of liquid and actually clathrate, uh, clathrates. Uh, we actually see mud volcanism out along the shores of Alaska and Siberia. And they actually have potentials of clathrates. <laughs> Uh, so my wonderful image I had at some point got corrupted on the way to here. So uh, here is the wonderful clip art I have for you today. So whenever you think of volcanoes, even if I were to ask school children, if you were to draw a volcano, you'd probably get the sense of like, okay, you know, some sort of tall structure, uh, that cartoon that Kelty, the, the Duke volcano, just a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, spewing out of it. You have some sort of large magma chamber and so on. Mud volcanoes, very similar in that regard. You still have some sort of magma chamber, but very uh, diapiric in that regard. It's very small, thin straws of material popping up, and they tend to be much lower, uh, lower depth down with their magma chambers. And instead of having material spewing out. It's rather actually just kind of flowing out from the vent. It's actually a flow and it's more vapor being spewed out. Uh, so in regards to that, uh, magmatic volcanism uh, as far as terrestrial goes, obviously higher temperatures, uh, a variety of shapes, uh, shield, cone, uh, uh, stratospheric, whatever, uh, and so on, but usually with tectonics, uh, with, whereas mud volcanism, you have more liquids and clathrates and hydrocarbons, which are also fun to deal with too. But the environment that they're found, you actually have that stress buildup, and the clues that lead into that are actually stress markers. Pay attention to that, stress markers. So I'm going to come back to that here pretty soon. And also uh, collapsing of any sort. You can find collapsing with mud volcanism as well. That will also be important later as well. So let's take a look at our wonderful Pluto candidates yet again. Uh, beautiful, beautiful Pluto. And you might be wondering, well, there was right in Picard. What in the world are these two? Get to that here in a bit. <laughs> All right, so our wonderful right mons uh, that we have here, top view as well. Picard, you can only see just the very slight bottom of it, uh, unfortunately. So yay haze layers and whatnot. Uh, but if you were to look at a wonderful oblique view of it, you have a possible uplift here. You also have a same kind of a, a vent uh, system here as well. It does show some relief uh, a little bit as well. It does have uh, some circular uh, faulting around it, as you would see around Picard, uh, uh, as well. So there's another view of it as well. So it's, it's fairly large. Uh, not a lot of measurements have been done with that, but at least it's like, oh, well, that's a possibility. And then we have our lovely special guest here. We have Hecla Cavus. So Hecla Cavus, uh, coming to a journal near you, uh, is actually, close your ears, Carl, 
I, uh, called their alike <laughs> feature. <laughs> I, so why we say that, though, is it's actually very irregular. Now, granted, it is uh, pushed along by other craters around the system, but there are clues that lead into a caldera-like collapse, at least some sort of collapse deal. So the arrows I have here, uh, the arrow up here, though, is actually looking at fissures that are actually coming out of the rim here. There's also, uh, I have a whole list of clues that deals with the collapse of this feature. But these main arrows here, unfortunately, I don't think it shows up. Well, it shows up well there. Uh, is that there's actually ring faults uh, around the rim here. So these are stress markers. These are actual stress markers from either the previous, whatever structure it would have been, or at least from the collapse. So there's actually two main clues that I'm going to go through to have this lean toward mud volcanism. Though One of them is the height-base ratio, which means, again, if you have something as tall and skinny or something squishy and bulgy, uh, every single volcano has a certain identity uh, as far as its shape goes, as far as its morphology goes. I'm not talking about flows or anything, but just the pure structure and shape of the volcanoes, though. So going along with that, go, looking at height-base uh, ratios uh, and so on of multiple, most of these are terrestrial, except the ones that said Mars. Uh, I did the Mars volcano uh, ones myself. Granted, that does not include Olympus Mons because that is a very special case of being the largest volcano in the solar system. We're counting that out. Uh, so Mars volcanoes, uh, for that number, is only small uh, domical uh, shaped mounds in the Tharsis region, actually. Uh, but again, looking at the shape, now granted we're only having two data points here. We have Wright and Picard. Uh, but their height-base ratio match pretty well with offshore mud volcanoes that we see in Siberia and Alaska. And then clue number two, the stress markers. Coming back to those stress markers again, uh, stress markers are meaning not so much of looking at the flows, because then you're looking at circular flows and you obviously can't really get much of a direction if it's a circle. Uh, but so much of some lineations that you would see kind of radiating out uh, here and there with those structures. So you could actually see a few of them coming out from Picard, mostly from Wright. Uh, very, very small details with uh, unnamed, <laughs> uh, and then some of it from Hecla. <laughs> uh, so there's our wonderful Pluto again. So if we have all those stress markers and relate them to some sort of orientation, we have some sort of rose diagrams going on here. And you can almost see some sort of movement pattern. So relating to mud volcanism, though, the stress patterns actually relate to some sort of movement, where the movement has either gone, where it's going, to and from. We still don't know that yet, but at least there's some sort of direction. <laughs> Maybe. At least some sort of direction going on. Uh, so comparison-wise, for Pluto. We are dealing with clathrates. We are dealing with methane gas. Uh, we do see stress markers, obviously low temperatures uh, at 40K. Um, the question mark here is obviously still up in the air of how in the world do these things grow. Hmm. Uh, but yeah, OK. So we still have some sort of good correlation with mud volcanism. Great. So now. Possible formations. These have actually come from the Encyclopedia of Volcanoes, which if any of you guys have read, it's a book this thick. It's wonderful. It's a wonderful reference. I highly recommend it. Uh, so I actually talked to one of the editors of that book to help out with this. Uh, so we have a pretty good idea to actually relate it to some of what we see here as far as mud volcanism goes with low temperatures though. So we came up with three scenarios uh, in that regard. So first one is <coughs> rapid uh, sedimentation or displacement. So that's either meaning Pluto has a 5,000 year old flood <laughs> uh, or some sort of major event to completely move that material and then bring it back and slush it out and so on. 
Uh, uh, scenario number two is layer movement. So in the sense of dikes and sill movement, uh, whether it's very lava lamp-like where it would just kind of bulge, it, woo, bulge in one area, move to the next one, uh, but essentially it's just going to just kind of ebb and flow all over the place by layers. And then the third one is tectonic shortening. Uh, we don't see a lot of uh, surficial tectonics whatsoever, but in the sense of uh, subsurface, however, that could be something interesting to look into as far as faulting goes. We do see some major faulting on the surface, more northern uh, as well, though. I personally like uh, the first one, though, but hey, we, we love to get ideas. We want to get more ideas. <laughs> All right, so obviously there are some remaining questions, uh, as, as Kelsey has very much put that into view, especially for New Horizons data where we don't really have terribly much. And as an experimentalist working with Pluto, I can tell you that we still have a lot to learn about ice mixtures, especially the nature, the behavior, the rheology. It is awful to work with in the lab. Um, but then is there some sort of variability with that kind of resources? Do the resources change across the surface of Pluto? Do we have pockets of clathrates uh, in certain places on Pluto and not just a homogenous layer of clathrates? Does that have something to do with it? Why do we only see these formations on the south? Obviously, are there more? <laughs> are there more than what we're seeing? We're only seeing one part of Pluto. Are there more on the other side? In which case, I'm uh, pretty sure the one defining answer that we have through all of this, that I'm sure all of you guys can agree, is that we have to go back. <laughs> Absolutely, 100%, we have to go back. So I will leave you with my summary that these mounds may be somewhat leaning toward mud volcanism processes. Uh, certainly some sort of movement and collapsing can occur, uh, has occurred, uh, but we certainly need uh, a lot more ideas. Thank you. Are there questions for Caitlin? Um, I would urge caution in using aspect ratios, height over diameter, for example, when comparing features on different bodies. Mm. Pluto has such low gravity, it's going to do something different to the dispersal of material around right. the vent. Right. That's something I've run up against. Um, <laughs> have you thought about how, th how that plays into your interpretation? We have thought about buoyancy, and I'm I, very curious about Pat's talk as well, though. So yes, that has been uh, at least in discussion. <laughs> Carl? Um, yeah, this is on. Um, with regards mud volcanoes on Earth, they tend to form fields of individual features. Um, and there's a slight tendency within volcanism for very high concentrations of energy to form large individual features and more diffuse uh, slight increases in local heat energy to form lots of individual features. Mm -hmm. Have you looked at broader context of mud volcanoes uh, comparing not just individual features but their, how they relate to each other uh, what entire fields are like right so actually mud volcanoes are more close together mm -hmm. uh, they're more clustery and that goes back to the stress markers where you would have usually some sort of feature stress marker would point this way and then another feature would pop up there a stress marker this way and point up so there is some sort of direction terrestrial wise yeah and my point is that these look pretty huge i mean they, 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 oh, they yeah. do not look mm -hmm. like uh, the scale that i associate with mud volcanoes or the proliferation of individual vents that oh, i associate sure. with yeah. mud so, volcanoes so onshore versus onshore or uh, offshore mud volcanoes onshore mud volcanoes are actually uh nearing the four to seven kilometer uh, range so that is good offshore volcanoes there hasn't actually been a lot of instrumentation imaging uh, unfortunately for earth so unfortunately was there one more quick question over here 
So I'm I'm not sure if I really understand what the difference between the mud volcano is and you know, let's say normal cryovolcanism. Mm-hmm. I mean, on the Earth, a mud, mud volcanism, you have the pore fluid there that lubricates mm-hmm. whatever you know feature happens. But on Pluto, you still have to actually melt stuff to make a slurry, right? And so there's latent heat involved in that, and that's sort of a standard. I mean, I would think you know, so latent heat is still important, right? You need to have a heat source for all of this, right? Sure. And I'd, so what I'd then is the big di- so because you don't on Earth you don't need a heat source to make a mud volcano, right? Right. So in this case it would be whether you have clathrates popping, <laughs> uh, you can have over pressurized uh, slurry still. So in a sense, yeah, okay, you still don't really need a heat source for this particular part either. Maybe the movement part. But but with that, are you suggesting something that's entirely solid state or is there liquid of some sort or gas? I mean, to make either, you need Ooh. to warm it up, right? With mm, maybe I'm just yeah. not understanding. For clathrates, probably not. But are you assuming the clathrates just dissociate and then that makes it go, or? Right. I'm saying that clathrates are a, a pretty big factor, but as far as what kind of inf- or what kind of information that we have for clathrates, as far as laboratory work goes, ugh. <laughs> unfortunately, we don't have a lot of information about. Clap rates. Hmm? 